Right, hello, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Faithless Forrest. And I'm Chad Headley. And we want you to know that if you don't believe in God, you're not alone. Right here in East Tennessee, you can find free-thinking atheists and agnostics. This is a show for them and for people committed to a life rooted in science and free of supernatural beliefs. On today's show, we have a phone-in guest, Gleb Topersky, and we're going to talk to him about his new book, Finding Your Purpose in Life Using Science, assuming we can get him on the phone. First, we want to tell you a little bit about the sponsors of the show. The Atheist Society of Knoxville frequently has a fun meetup at a bar or eatery. Tonight's meetup is at Barley's in the Old City, starting at around 5.30. Look for the silver-jacketed copy of The God Delusion standing upright on the table. And as Matt Delahunty at Atheist Experience says, everyone is welcome to our happy hour for food, drink, and conversation. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke, or punch, please don't. Mm -hmm. All right. The Rationalists of East Tennessee have seg several regular monthly meetings. The first and third Sunday mornings of the month are usually lectures with lively roundtable discussions. The second Sunday, we hold Skeptics Book Club. On the fourth Sunday, we are mixing it up. Sometimes with a get-together, we call Reflections Meeting. It features a potluck lunch in someone's home. Sometimes we play board games or similar activities. Once in a while, we've had picnics as well. All right. Later on in the show, we will give you our website to websites to visit for additional details, including times and locations. Let's go in the news. All right. Well, members on the Atheist Society of Knoxville's Facebook page alerted me to the following item. I guess this is a TV show. 19 Kids and Counting is off the air after the oldest son admitted to molesting two of his sisters and a girl from another family. The Dugers are part of the horrible, quiverful movement, and that ensures that they didn't get counseling for their daughters and didn't take their son to a police station. The organization Reproductive Health Reality Check reports, Quiverful probably began as a self-conscious movement with the publication of Rick and Jan Hess's 1989 book, A Full Quiver, Family Planning and the Lordship of Christ, in which they argue that God, as the great physician and sole birth controller, is in charge of opening and closing the womb on a case-by-case -case basis. Women's attempts to control their own bodies, the Lord's temple, are a seizure of divine power. The Lord's temple, huh? I think a person owns their own body. Yahweh can get one of his own. All right. Now, well, let's see. Also in the news, the Center for Medical Progress released a video supposedly proving that Planned Parenthood sells dead fetal tissue, and it went viral this week. It's now proven that the video was heavily edited and the IRS may go after the organization for misrepresenting itself as a biomedicine charity. And the nonprofit's registration form is Troy Newman, who runs Operation Rescue, an anti-choice activist group who have inspired killers of providers of reproductive services, including abortion. CNN makes the following report. Federal regulations state that women must decide to have an uh, uh, must decide to have an abortion before clinicians can ask whether they would like to donate fetal tissue. One concern is that women would have more pregnancies or abortions because they want to donate fetal tissue. In addition, clinicians performing the abortions cannot receive payment from researchers who will receive fetal materials except for reimbursements of costs such as shipping. The tiny sum of money discussed in the video sounds like a bargain even for shipping. Yeah, but apparently, you know, when you ship uh, a tissue that has to be kept frozen and stuff like that, you know, that, you know, that's not just, you know, a f six dollar priority mail envelope uh, kind of fee. All right, from their website, the Center for Medical Progress is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to monitoring and reporting on medical ethics and advances. Seems that their ethics do not include telling the truth. News flash from the book of Yahweh. Exodus 20, verse 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In the King James, or more commonly, do not lie. So, do not lie there, Medical Center for Progress. All right. Well, also here in Tennessee, there was a shooting in Chattanooga. 
Fox News reported in error that ISIS had tweeted responsibility just before the shooting started, but it turns out their crack reporters could not get the time zones correct. Speculating and spinning on ISIS involvement even after the time zone mistake was uncovered, Bill O'Reilly again misses the involvement of people of Abrahamic religion directly in the so-called Holy Lands worldwide and now in Tennessee. Yeah, as I was driving here to the studio today, there was more information coming in on that. It, you know, it sounds like this guy was uh, you know, alone. He wasn't working with ISIS, and he had been, I guess, you know, searching the internet for, you know, principles about martyrdom and stuff. So he appears to definitely be motivated by an Abrahamic religion, but um, there doesn't appear to be an ISIS connection at this time. All right. Well, we ha in addition to this news, we've got, oh yeah, you, you've got a piece for us you found, I guess, out of Boulder, Colorado? This is from uh, Daily Camera in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Boulder prosecutors allege four Vine Life church officials accused of covering up reports that a youth pastor at the church sexually assaulted a teenage congregant and refused to accept responsibility for their actions and created a disturbing culture of secrecy and non-disclosure at the church. At the heart of the case is the local church's coordinated effort to conceal a victim's report of repeated acts of sexual abuse perpetrated by a youth pastor, the son of one of the church's elders from the church's own congregation. The local community and law enforcement of Boulder County prosecutors wrote a wrote in a sentence memorandum filed in the case. Well, it, it sounds like these people haven't learned the lesson that the Catholic Church has been slowly coming to grips with, and that is that when you've got problems in, in your church, you can't cover it up. You know, they, they appear to have been more interested in, in maintaining their image than protecting this teenager. Sounds like they learn more from 19 kids and counting. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, um, let's see, we've uh, got some uh, anniversaries uh, to observe here. So today is July 21st, 2015. Yesterday was July 20th and the 46th anniversary of the first human footprint on the moon, a triumph of science and technology. This past weekend was the 157th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention, a convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of a woman. The results of that convention was the publication of the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments. Patterned after the Revolutionary War's Declaration of Independence, this document is the first by any such convention to call for a woman's right to vote. Only one of the persons signing that document in 1848 lived long enough to actually vote after the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, organizer of the convention, said years later, in the early days of the women's suffrage agitation, I saw that the greatest obstacle we had to overcome was the Bible. It was hurled at us on every side. July 21st in 1925 was the day when John Scopes was convicted of violating the Butler Act. Tennessee's Butler Act prohibited the teaching of human evolution in public schools. Wikipedia reports, the trial publicized the fundamentalist modernist controversy which set modernists who said evolution was not inconsistent with religion against fundamentalists who said the Word of God as revealed in the Bible took priority over all human knowledge. Just think of the fundamentalist ideas still trying to survive in the light of modern science. The Hebrew Bible, writing that there was night and day before the sun, the moon, and stars were created on the fourth day. Would it not be fun to have a time machine and go find the authors of that nonsense and tell them about the 1969 landing on the moon a world of mountains and craters and rocks older than they ever found the earth. And dinosaurs, don't forget to tell them, those uh, Bronze Age people, about dinosaurs. Viewers, what would you tell the Bronze Age authors of the Hebrew Bible if you could? All right. Well, it would appear that the technology is with us, and 
our our guest has called in. Gleb, are you there? All right. Um, could you speak up again? All righty, great. Um, Can you hear me well? Uh, I'm hearing you okay. Um, is Sam able to hear us through the uh, the rest of the system? He says he thinks so. So I think we're going to have okay. to charge ahead and hope the viewers get you as well. So viewers, okay. we ha we have with us via telephone technology, uh, scholar, scientist, popularize popularizer educator, social entrepreneur, and now author, Dr. Gleb Tuspersky. This is a call-in show, so we in would invite you to participate with your question to our guest by calling the number on your screen. Gleb, did I even approximate the pronunciation of your last name, and can you maybe help us with that? Sure. Uh, you actually did a really good, great job. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's Tuspersky, so you got it right on, and... Uh, Great. You don't have to go through. You don't have to say it. Gleb will be fine. All right. Well, I'm, just, yeah. I'm going to take the cowardly way out and use Gleb as well. All right. Please, please, please. So, before talking about your book, can uh, you tell us uh, and the viewers uh, about the other identities you have besides author, scholar, educator, popular science, so science popularizer, and social entrepreneur? What are they all about? Sure, sure, happy to tell you. So, um, my professional background is as a, uh, a professor and a professor at Ohio State University, uh, go back. And uh, I am a historian of science, and I study the area, the intersection of the history of psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and medicine. And I'm specifically interested in the questions of meaning and purpose, emotion, decision making agency, social control in various settings, and specifically non-American settings. I uh, decided to focus my research on the major secular alternative to the United States in the 20th century, which was the Soviet Union. That was the major modern contemporary society that was the alternative to the Soviet one. So I decided to focus my research on that field, and that is where I can take information from that and apply it to our current world from a really non-biased perspective, from a perspective that's an outside perspective, outside of our current context. So that's the area of scholarship. As an educator, so as I mentioned, I'm a professor uh, at Ohio State, and so I've been teaching there for a while. And as a science popularizer, more recently I've gotten into popularizing the science on psychology and cognitive neuroscience and medicine as they apply to our thinking and feeling patterns. And that brings me to my identity as a social entrepreneur. So I'm the co-founder and volunteer president of an all-new all-volunteer nonprofit, Intentional Insights. And this is an organization devoted to helping reason-oriented people empower themselves to improve their thinking, feeling, and behavior patterns based on research, based on various sorts of research, as I mentioned. So popularizing the science and applying it to daily life. It's essentially a really new genre, a new field of science-based self-improvement. You know, we have, in the reason-oriented movement, we have people who popularize material science, such as Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, they do a great job. But we don't really have people who popularize brain science and how relevant it is for daily life, for our relationships, for how we think about ourselves, for how we think about our lives, how we feel about it. So this is the area that I am focusing on with my efforts and with this organization. Gleb, let me ask a clarification there. Let me ask a clarification there. Um, you were saying how you know we have the, the popularizers of the physical science and then you were yeah. contrasting that with something, and I missed a, a word there that, that, that meant sure. that I didn't quite follow that. So back we up. We don't have popularizers in the reason-oriented movement of brain science. Brain science, of there brain. we go. Right. Yeah. Like psychology and cognitive neuroscience. And these are the fields that are so relevant for how we live our lives, how we think about ourselves, 
how we think about our relationship, how we think about uh, just our being in the world and society itself. For example, how, how do we make our decisions? You know, it's very easy for us to just make decisions based on what are called cash patterns and uh, thinking patterns. I'll give you an example. So when we go to have a meeting with a boss, let's say we have uh, a boss and we go with the meeting to the annual review with a boss, and the boss presents us with some constructive criticism. The natural human tendency is to be very defensive, is to be very defensive and just hide and plug one's ears and yell, la, 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 I don't want to hear you. All right. That's, that's natural. That's, that's what our lizard brain, our emotional self, is naturally predisposed to do. What would be rational would be to really listen to this feedback and take it fully and improve based on the feedback. But that's not the that's not the intuitive natural thing to do. It's it's so much better for us throughout life to be making these more rational decisions, where and to shift our emotions to make more rational decisions, to want and desire that feedback, that constructive criticism, and that is an example of a basic strategy that the organization discusses. So how to do these everyday life things and how to think about them better. And that's intentional insight. The website is intentionalinsights.org and we have blogs, videos, online classes, books, everything, all of this content essentially finds based self improvement materials, evidence based stuff. All right. And and so I guess the interesting kind of thing is that you you can also bring uh, a perspective to it in that you haven't grown up entirely in the United States. Yes, I haven't been brought up uh, in the United States, and I grew up in the Soviet Union until I was 10, and then my parents immigrated when it was falling apart to the United States. So I had a leg up when I decided to study the Soviet Union and get that outside perspective on the American system, because the best way to really understand where we live and our society is to look at it from the outside, from the outside in. And so that gave me a real leg up in understanding the Soviet Union and being able to bring that knowledge to our society here. What did you find surprising as you immersed yourself in Western and Christian worldview? Well, one of the really surprising things was um, how individualistic it was and how it discounted the importance of social bonds and relationships and ties. So we in our Western society are very individualistically oriented. However, much of the research on cognitive neuroscience, psychology, medicine, really shows how humans are social animals and how much we are dependent on others. And the current setup in our society really undercuts this mutual dependence and our ability to interact well with other people. And as a counterexample would be the Soviet Union or Japan or Sweden or China, a lot of other societies which are more collectively oriented and really pay attention, pay close, nuanced, careful attention to these ties between individuals. So in my research on the Soviet Union, I examined these cultural institutions called clubs, and they were essentially civic centers, community centers, that provided opportunities for social bonds, community networking, social support of various sorts, that are in the United States really present only in churches, so only in religious settings. And unfortunately, they, there are many less secular alternatives in the United States. And that's some of the information I was able to find in the Soviet Union. And they have similar institutions, as I mentioned, in Sweden, Norway, other countries, Japan, China, countries that are also democratically oriented, capitalistic, not necessarily China, but Japan, uh, Scandinavian countries, well, and other countries in Europe. Well, Gleb, a, a question yes. has occurred to me, and that is, you know, um, 
I think really in the past 10 years, the, the Orthodox Church has been really trying to reassert itself in, in Russia. And so have things like the clubs been um, that were government funded, have they ceased to exist and the, the church is taking advantage of this void? if you're watching us online we put up the big slide with the the question mark and asking the question asking the question and if I only I could read what is the meaning of life and you know how can evidence-based science informed approach go so so this this great big question mark here what did you want to say about in answer to that How does having a lack of meaning and purpose impact people's mental and physical health? Gleb, let me, let me um, uh, actually raise a, a, a kind of, it's almost, it's almost like a personal kind of question, and that is, or really it's sort of a question as to how well you've uh, experienced some American culture. 
Have you ever seen the movie starring John Dean called Rebel Without a Cause? Yes, yes, I have. Um, would that have been something that you would have seen as a youngster in the former Soviet Union, or did you see that after coming here to the United States? Uh, yeah, I saw it after coming here to the United States. They generally wouldn't play that sort of movie in the Soviet Union because it was not, it wouldn't be very uh, considered appropriate for for Soviet citizens to watch that sort of stuff. <laughs> Well, as as you were talking about, though, you know, not having a purpose, leaving, giving, you know, leading teens to risky behavior, I couldn't help but think of the title of that movie, The Rebel Without a Cause. Of course, you know, we actually, yeah. we, we watched it in high school, and then we had discussion about it, and the, the, the teacher made a point that, in a sense, we all have a cause, and at that age, it is, it is trying to kind of finish growing up. Um, and that, you know, to say without a cause is to miss the point that growing up is a, is, is a hard thing. Yeah, I think that movie is really not, the title is misleading. James Dean has a purpose, which is to free himself of the adults and societal influences and really live the kind of life that he wants to live. It's a very individualistically oriented movie. So, and that ties into the sense of individualism, which I was talking about in the United States. It is, he does have a purpose, but he, he tries to live that purpose. It might not be explicitly stated in the movie what his purpose is, but it's very implicit throughout the movie. All right. All right. Uh, well, interesting that you have at least seen that. All right. <laughs> So, can you perhaps tell us about science-based strategies for finding meaning and purpose in life for someone like James Dean's character? Sure. And that for anyone, uh, there are, science has shown that there are three broad areas into finding meaning and purpose in life. And those three areas are self-reflection, so sitting down and using various techniques of reflecting on meaning and purpose in life. And I describe those in detail in my book, Find Your Purpose Using Science. Um, then, and it's available on the Intentional Insights website. If you go to www.intentionalinsights.org, you'll see the second post down is about that. Then self-reflection, then community engagement. So community engagement includes things like getting together in groups, like your group in Moscow, the rationalist group, and so on. So various groups getting together and engaging with these groups. And also family engagement, so engaging with one's family, engaging with friends, so community and social bond. The third big strategy is serving others. So engaging in social service to other people, volunteering, then various forms of philanthropy and various philanthropic donations that are meaningful to you. So philanthropic donations, uh, effective altruism is a particularly good area to donate. It's an evidence-based area. And of course, I need to mention that Essential Insights is a 501c3 nonprofit and would appreciate any donations as well. Then uh, political engagement. So engaging in political activities that are important and meaningful to you. Again, and that is a way of serving others. All right. um, did you say something like effective altruism? There was an adjective there I wasn't certain I yes, got. Yes, effective, effective altruism. Okay. It's a new uh, movement dedicated to evidence-based evaluation of philosophy of charities. Um, so I, I, I puzzled over that because my, my first thought was, well, where would there be non-effective altruism? Or you know, the, the adjective didn't seem necessary. But then, I, of course, I remembered the famous saying from uh, Annie Laurie Gaylor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation that nothing fails like prayer. So prayer yeah. is, would be ineffective altruism, I guess. Indeed, and uh, as I'm sure all of us know, donations to churches are the largest, you know, are the plurality of the donations that Americans give. I would argue that around the, the vast majority, the large majority of those donations 
may qualify as ineffective actions. Perhaps because they're supporting a pastor or minister who is not always directing his his congregation to effective engagement in the real world? Yes, yes, uh, exactly. And uh, hmm. if your goal is to be altruistic and help improve the world, donations to churches are not necessarily the best way of improving the world. You know, things like donations to soup kitchens or malaria nets for people in Africa might be more effective ways of improving the world than donations to churches. I mean, I remember going to Jerusalem and going to the temples there and seeing the beautiful decorations made of gold and thinking about what if all of that stuff was sold and just invested into feeding hungry children? You know, it would be a, such a more effectively altruistic use of that sort of um, largest of that sort of money than, I, than just having it be in churches in Jerusalem. Yeah, I, I must say I have to agree with you on that. Uh, the same observation has been made about the Vatican as well. Yes, of course. Of course. We, we are, though, at about the halfway point, and I think what we'd like to do is ask you to stay on the line. And uh, Chad and I, we need to jump in and do our mid-program break here so that sure. viewers who have just tuned in will know who we are. And I guess here I go. In case you're just tuning in, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by them and by individual contributions. Shows are live most every Tuesday from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Knoxville Community Access Channel 12 and Channel 194, depending upon your local cable network. Tell your out-of-town friends to see us streaming online at ctvknox.org. This is a call-in show, and we are live today, July 21st, 2015. And viewers can call in now to the number on the screen with a short comment or question. Call in now while we go to an informative break. All right. The screen's gone blank. I have we no idea. Are the, are the viewers still else? watching us or well, the video? Not alone. The well, it looks like we have technical Fox difficulties here. We may have to plow on and, and do the video another week. All right. The Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, meets two times a week. We have evening meetups for fun food, drink, and conversation. Ask's purpose is to supply a venue for community, camaraderie, and outreach to atheists, agnostic, free thinkers, and other like-minded people. All right. Um, we're meeting this evening at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria in the Knoxville Old City. The second Sunday of most months is the Skeptics Book Club. The title of the August book is Sons of Wichita, How the Koch Brothers Became America's Most Powerful and Private Dynasty by Daniel Shulman. Sunday, August 9 at 2 p.m. The public is invited to participate. You need not have read the book to attend, but of course it helps. Visit rationalist.org to find the rest of the calendar of books and join us at the new location, Books A Million, 8513 Kingston Pike, Knoxville, Tennessee. Both the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee provide a social outlet where you'll find that if you don't believe in Zeus or follow Zoroaster or say yuck to Yahweh, you, you are, are not alone. alone. All right. Well, today we have a, a phone-in interview. Uh, we're speaking with Gleb. I don't even have it written in front of me. Tispersky, did I get it anywhere correct there this time, yeah. Gleb? Yeah. All right. All right, well, I've, I've had a few times to practice. Gleb is an author of a book, Finding Your Purpose in Life Using Science, and we have been discussing it uh, with him. We urge viewers to call in and ask Gleb about finding a purpose in life um, and how it is that people without faith um, can find plenty of purpose in life, contrary to the assertions of religious people. Chad, where did we leave off? We had some questions here for it, for Gleb. Uh, we were uh, just finishing uh, with the, uh, the 
strategies to find meaning and purpose in life. Uh, how can people actually measure and evaluate their current level of meaning and purpose? How can they measure and evaluate any gains they make? Sure, I think that's a really important question. So we as reason-oriented, science-oriented people, are, or, are, it is important for us to evaluate and mm -hmm. have metrics. So the book that you, that, uh, you mentioned, Find Your Purpose Using Science, that I wrote, and it's, again, it's, it's available. You can learn more about it at the Intentional Insights website, so www.intentionalinsights.org. And this book has a quantitative instrument which you can use to evaluate your sense of meaning and purpose. It's called the Meaning and Purpose Questionnaire. It's based on the research in psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and medicine on the actual things that cause us to experience meaning and purpose in life things that I mentioned before, things such as self-reflection, things such as community bonds, and things such as social justice, and a variety of other related questions. And then, so the way the book goes is it has that evaluated instrument at the beginning, so then you go through the book and you do a series of exercises. You first you read the thinkers about meaning and purpose, the science on it, and then there are a series of exercises on meaning and purpose, to develop one sense of meaning and purpose. They include things like developing a sense of your long-term goals and how you do that, developing the connection from them to your daily life, journaling about them, which is a science-based way of figuring out meaning and purpose, secular meditation, which is another science-based way of discovering, understanding your meaning and purpose. Then they have a, the book has a variety of strategies for engaging in community activities and experiencing meaning and purpose for that, and then social justice. All right. And finally, an overall plan to bring it all together, finishing up with another questionnaire of the same sort, the meaning and purpose questionnaire. All right. So I, you, I, have a co I, and you have a questionnaire at the beginning that measures your meaning and purpose. Then the whole book, then a questionnaire at the end. So you can clearly know the extent of change in your meaning and purpose as you go through the book itself. So right. it gives you that clear metric, so you don't have any doubt. Well, Gleb, I can see how that, yeah. that is a kind of a scientific method. You are measuring, and you're making a, a change, and then attempting to measure the effect of the change. While you were t speaking, we've been alerted. We have our first call, and um, so here we go. You should be able to hear the caller as well. Um, we'll, we're going to push the button and bring them on. Hello, caller. This is Free Thought Forum TV. Can we get a name or a nickname, please? Yeah, it's Charles from Central Illinois. Believe it or not, I had a guy call me. All right. Hello, uh, Charles. Uh, um, do you have a comment or question for our, our, um, our guest, yes. Gleb? All right. Well, let, let's hear it, and then we'll need to find out if Gleb is hearing you as well. Okay. Given the marvels we've discovered through the use of science, I find uh, one of the purposes of my life to see just how much beauty and wonderful things that are out there. And is there a, 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 a biological, kind of biological or psychological basis for that kind of thing? Gleb, did you get uh, Charles's question? I think I got most of it. Let me see. I will try to repeat it and say it was, you can correct me if I'm wrong. He, Charles said uh, something like that he finds uh, meaning and purpose in the beauty of life, in the beauty of nature, and he asked if there's a way to measure that. Am I correct? Charles, did, right. did, did he get the question correctly? No. Could there be a neurological and biological uh, basis for the pleasure I find in the things we find through science? Ah, so a measure for the pleasure uh, of the, uh, that you find in that meaning? Yes. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so the meaning and purpose questionnaire has a measure for the extent of meaning that you find on a 1 to 10 scale. And 
in their full various activities. It's designed so that you can evaluate your own sense of meaning and purpose. It's not, it doesn't correlate necessarily to what that meaning and purpose brings to you. That's an individual measure. But it evaluates your current sense of meaning and purpose. And it, it, it enables you to go through a variety of activities which, from the science on meaning and purpose, will likely help you increase your sense of meaning and purpose. For example, if you find meaning and purpose in the natural wonder of the world, there are strategies to increase that. For example, journaling about these natural wonders, engaging in meditation around these natural wonders, engaging in community activities built around your sense of natural wonder. You can talk about them to people in, a, in the atheist society of Nostal and so on. Or engage in community service. For example, if you enjoy nature itself, you can engage in hikes, nature cleanup, and so on. So there are a variety of strategies to increase that sense of meaning and purpose, whatever you find meaning and purpose in through using these science-based strategies. China? That's uh, where I was considering. I'm glad to have uh, at least one person person confirm that. Like the flyby of Pluto, or the intricate wing, um, uh, intricate uh, rings of Saturn, or the discovery of uh, of a, a lake buried underneath miles of ice in Antarctica, all give me a nice thrill of discovery. Yeah, I mean, definitely, that's one thing that you, it sounds like these are the things that you get your sense of meaning and purpose from, and if you're currently satisfied with that, that's great, that's wonderful. So, if you choose to increase your sense of meaning and purpose, and the pleasure that you get from it, you know where to go, find your purpose using science, but if you're happy where you currently are, that's great as well. All right. Well, Charles, uh, uh, thank you for uh, for helping us uh, interview uh, Gleb here. Do you have any more? Do you have something quick? We we got about 15 minutes left. We could, you know, entertain a quick question, then we should clear the line so we could get some more. Yes. Did you uh, uh, hear the latest on uh, the Chattanooga, Tennessee shooter? It, well, we, we, we spoke a little earlier in the program about that. The, the latest thing I heard on NPR, so it sounds like he was acting alone. He was searching the Internet for ideas on martyrdom. Um, and so to the extent that, you know, he was claimed to have been, you know, coordinating with ISIS, that appears to be uh, a no baseless show. hysteria. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, he was also extensively into drug use. And um, apparently it was having uh, severe mental problems. Uh, he had been fired from a really good job because of that. And um, so it, it seems to be a lot more complicated than a lot of people want it to be. They all want to blame it on just radical Muslims or Muslims in general. Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't observe that that the Abrahamic faiths have as some of their central important acts child sacrifice you know Abraham yeah. is the the founder of the Abrahamic faiths because he was you know prepared to sacrifice his own son and Yahweh rewarded well, him with even that. before Abraham because in uh, part of Genesis they have a, a statement, well, thou shalt sacrifice unto the Lord the firstborn of all the living things, including your son, which seems to predate Abraham himself. Yep, yep. So, um, but uh, let, let's move back, let's move away from religion and back to more promising things, finding a meaning of life using science. 
Charles, uh, thank you for calling in, and we'll say goodbye for now. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, viewers, we have about 14 minutes left. Uh, we'll be able to take calls to the last, oh, I don't know, five to three minutes of the show. But if you'd like to ask a question about finding purpose and meaning in life using science, uh, please uh, give us a call right away. Um, I made some notes while you were answering, uh, I forget if you were answering Charles' question. Or not. Here's what I've written. I've written meditation and Sam Harris. So something you said about meditation reminded me that Sam Harris talks about this as well. Um, and, you know, I, I, I know that some people have, you know, complained about classes of meditation, sorry, classroom activities involving meditation in the public schools as claiming that that is somehow promoting some sort of non-Christian religion. So when you say meditation, what do you think of that? And, you know, can't that really be secular? Uh, yes, definitely. Meditation, of course, can be secular. Um, I wouldn't, I am not, um, I don't know about the specific issues with meditation in high school, so I can't comment on that. But I can comment specifically on secular meditation. So um, John Kabat-Zinn was the progenitor he was, the God, he was the early father of bringing secular forms of meditation into Western medicine. And this started in the late 1970s, early 80s. He conducted a number of studies showing the benefits of meditation for improving mental health and physical health, especially physical, with physical health. It was especially having to do with things like decreasing blood pressure and dealing with pain and various other things that are associated with how our brain affects our body. With mental health, there are many more benefits with better well-being, degrees of anxiety, degrees with depression, of depression and various other indicators of mental well-being. So there is a lot of science backing up the benefits of meditation. And the only reason I myself took up meditation and I advocate meditation is because the science is there to back it up. All right, well, that's great. While you were speaking, we've been, uh, been uh, shown there's another call waiting for us. So we'll bring them on. And caller, can we get a name or a nickname for you, please? What you said was just fine. Caller works out pretty well. All right, caller. And do you have a comment or a question for our author, Gleb? Yeah. Uh, I, well, actually, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing on the computer. But I've caught most everything, and at one point it said, uh, I believe you said science can answer what is the meaning of life. I believe that it's exactly what he said, because I think he said it twice. And um, I, the answer to the meaning of life is something I usually thought that science sort of shied away from. So this is kind of a departure, isn't it? Well, Gleb, did you get uh, caller's question? Yes, the caller is surprised that uh, science is dealing with questions of meaning and purpose in life. No, no, that, that science does you. not usually apply to the meaning of life, but you are. Well, I, I'm a little worried about semantics issue here. For one thing, okay. uh, uh, Gleb, you're not saying that there is one meaning of life and science has found no. it. You're not saying that, no. right? Not at all. Science has, this is all about the, uh, discovering the individual meaning of life for oneself. How one oh, okay. gains an individual sense of meaning and purpose in life. So the science, uh, as, I meant, as I talked about earlier in the show, is not saying that there's one meaning of, of life. It is saying there are clear strategies based on the science for how one can gain a personal, individual sense of meaning and person, on purpose in life. Different people can have different senses of meaning and purpose in life, and that's totally fine. That's what the research shows. But there are specific strategies to gain this sense of meaning and purpose, and the science has shown how this is beneficial for our mental and physical health. So if we want good in mental and physical health, we should try to gain a strong sense of meaning and personal purpose in life. And that's what I'm talking about in the book, Find Your Purpose Using Science, a 
available on intentionalinsights.org top post. I, I see. So using this technique, a person might find that his meaning in life is dancing the ballet, or his meaning in life might be painting, or his meaning in life might be some sort of uh, maybe a scientific endeavor, that which makes one get, have a purpose for getting up in the, in the morning. Would that be about correct? So the science shows that meaning in life is derived from three aspects, three broad strategies, self-reflection, community activities, and serving others. So things like dancing, to the extent that dancing involves all three of those. For example, if you're a dancer and you dance in a community troop and you do free performances for others, so you have, and you self-reflect on your dancing, that would be the kind of thing that gives you meaning and purpose in life. Um, but it would have to involve all those three areas of self-reflection, of community activities, and of social service. I see. I see. Well, one, I, I believe that one might be a little bit suspicious. Of course, I can understand what you're saying here. But in the past, we've had people that's used, you know, the, the word science uh, in order to promote themselves, such as, you know, the Christian scientists or the Church of Scientology, and then there's such things as biorhythm yeah, and numerology. That, and that's unfortunate um, yeah. they have done so. I mean, my, my credentials should speak for themselves. I'm a professor of the history of science, teacher of Ohio State, and I'm a science popularizer. I've been I've published many, many peer-reviewed papers in journals. My academic book is coming out next year, so I'm quite uh, credential to speak about what the actual science is like. I can appreciate. Okay, so your so your scientific training is in what? It's in the history of science. History. The area of intersection between psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and medicine. So I took. I focus on the history of science because it allows me to draw on many scientific disciplines at once and well, I'm sure. not be limited to any one scientific discipline. I'm sure that your book would be a very good guide for anybody that's like you're saying, you know, somebody walking around going, what's the meaning of life? And by using your technique, I guess someone would be able to uh, figure out what the meaning of life is for them. I appreciate yes. the call. I was a little bit confused, so I thought I'd call in and try to, because uh, I couldn't hear all that well on the computer. Caller, before you go, and uh, let me ask Gleb a question that might help you. Gleb, I visited your website, and I, I think you have a few free activities as, there as well, right? So that you uh, yes, visitors there's could a, get it. There's a free version. The, the, there's a free version of the book, which includes everything except the exercise. The exercises that are available for three dollars for sort of two ninety nine. So the free book describes everything, the science, the philosophy, the health and well-being benefits include some exercises. So that's a great way to just get started and see what it's about. All right. Well, caller, uh, we want to thank you, and, and I'm going to yeah. ask you to clear the line. We may be able to take one more question. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so, Gleb, we've got about five minutes here, and assuming we don't get any callers, um, are there any questions that you wish Chad and I had asked you that uh, we should focus on in these last five minutes? Sure. So, um, I mentioned that I'm the, that I, so I wanted to share a little bit about how I find meaning and purpose in life. And based on the science itself, once I figured out what the science is, I started to engage in self-reflection, so I, I journal every day based on the science, specific findings about the benefits of journaling. I engage in meditation daily for the same reason. I engage in various sorts of community activities and so form social bonds, again, based on the scientific findings, and I engage in various civic uh, activities. So the, my goal of finding meaning and purpose and cultivating my own purpose in life and my own well-being resulted in me founding, co-founding the organization Intentional Insights, which is devoted to popularizing the science. And I co-founded it with my uh, spouse and partner, Agnes Um 
and a bunch of other great folks. We have a really great team here at Intentional Insights who are dedicated to helping others learn these strategies, these techniques, and have more rational thinking and emotional intelligence about brain science. And so this is my way of giving back to the world and serving others with sort of civic engagement. So that's why I'm being, donating most of the profit from the sale of the book, the worksheet part of it, um, Find Your Purpose Using Science and Intentional Insights that work to the organization itself, to promoting the mission. And I think it's really important for all of us as rational people to evaluate what we are about, why our thinking patterns are the way they are, why our feeling patterns are the way they are, why we do what we do, and come up with the most effective ways of achieving our goals. The only thing in life we can control is ourselves, our bodies, our minds, our thinking, feeling, and behavior patterns. And so it is incumbent upon us, it is very important for us to take as much control and have as much agency and have as much power over these domains as possible. And that's the kind of thoughts I want to leave your viewers with. And that's the kind of organization that I run, Intentional Insights and Intentional Insights that work. All right. Well, that's that's great. We, we've got about a minute left. And I know when, when I have the chance, I always love to show people uh, the rings of Saturn through a telescope. That's how I share science. Can you give me a 30-second summary of how you share science? Sure. So i just let you know that the way I share science is I ask people, what is the area of life under your control? And most people, they don't really think about what's under their control. They think, oh, my house, oh, my car, oh, my property, whatever, my house. Um, but it's not really under your control. You know, things can burn down. Your car can you stolen. The only things under your control that you can really influence is your mind. That's all that's in there. That's the rationalist perspective on life. That's what being rational is all about. So think about how you can improve your mind, how you can improve the way you control the only things in life you can control. So that's how I share about science. We have to be quick. Gleb? Do you see any similarities between uh, what you describe as the destruction of the clubs in Russia and a lot of the anti-science, uh, uh, junk science campaigns that are uh, coming about in the last uh, few years? And, and we got to do this in 30 seconds. Sure, in Russia. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, clubs definitely help promote the scientific viewpoint. One of their purposes was to promote science-based viewpoints, and that was part of the Soviet Union's mission to promote scientific viewpoints of life. And some of the attacks on them have been from the resurgence of religion to and attacking the science-based perspectives promoted in clubs. All righty. Well, hey, it's time to start wrapping things up. Get out your pen and paper. This has been Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Faithless Forrest. I'm Chad Headley. Please send us feedback. Leave voicemail at 865-272-9060 or email us at freethoughtforum at yahoo.com. You can see this show most Tuesdays from 5 to 6 p.m. And you can watch it online at ctvcanox.org. The opinions expressed on the show are of the host and guests, not any official opinion of ASK or RET. We would like to thank our viewers and send thanks to Sam Jonas for technical support, for, to the staff at CTV Knox, and, and to all. all